Hi everybody, I'm Ed Baker and welcome to ARC. ARC is the Addiction Recovery Channel. The Addiction Recovery Channel is dedicated <clears throat> to bringing information to the general public. Information that's both current and accurate. And I'm very pleased today uh, to welcome my guest, Sarah George. Thank you so much. By, by way of introduction, I'd like to read a quote uh, from Rebecca Kelly. Rebecca Kelly is the spokeswoman for Governor Scott's office. This quote is regarding Sarah's appointment, which was just about exactly one year ago. <clears throat> Ms. Kelly says, Sarah demonstrated strong character and a commitment to public service and justice that made the governor exceedingly confident in her ability to serve the people of Chittenden County and to be a steadfast advocate for the rights of victims. That's quite a recommendation, Sarah. <clears throat> you know, I cannot believe you're right that tomorrow is a year. It does mm -hmm. not seem possible. <laughs> mm -hmm. But thank you. It was. And that, that's a perfect uh, lead into my, my first question for you is, Basically, what has this first year been like for you? What has been your experience and what's shaped your initiatives heading into your second year, Sarah? So before I became appointed, I was a prosecutor in this same office. So TJ Donovan was my boss. Um, I was there for about six and a half years before I was appointed as the state's attorney. So. In terms of the everyday office experience, it hasn't changed a whole lot other than being in court a little less and being kind of out in the community a lot more. Mm -hmm. um, but I've been trying since day one really to shape my priorities as a state's attorney and then find ways within the community and within the courthouse to really implement those goals and um, focus on those priorities. All right. Can you? You know, for me, would you maybe choose uh, one of your top priorities going forward? Yeah, I mean, the, the clear one for me is the opioid crisis. That's definitely been something that's been very important to me. Um, and one of the reasons, obviously, that I'm here. Uh, law enforcement is a big priority for me, um, supporting our law enforcement. And, you know, it, it may seem like a small thing, but I'm doing everything I can to really highlight all of the positive things that our law enforcement is doing in this community because I feel like we're in a day and age where all of their negatives um, are really being exploited mm -hmm. and their positives aren't. And I see the positives every day. So I'm working on that as well. And um, my office, my office is a priority. My deputies making sure that they're paid what they should be to the extent I have that ability and um, making sure that they're getting what they need for resources. Absolutely. Along the lines of uh, law enforcement, I have gotten to know a little uh, Chief Del Pozo a little bit, and certainly Jackie uh, Corbelli, his um, you know liaison for, for uh, issues uh, regarding opi the opioid epidemic. Yeah. And um, I, I just remain completely impressed uh, with the ability of, of officials in, in Burlington and Chittenden County to familiarize themselves deeply with um, the elements that are contributing to the opioid crisis in Vermont. You have T.J. Donovan, you have uh, Brandon Del uh, Pozo, you have many, many people on almost vertical uh, learning curves, certainly Moreau, mm -hmm. Weinberger, uh, people every day facing death, um, you know, uh, the crime related to the opioid epidemic. Uh, and struggling every day for for solutions. So I would I would join you in that. We're very very fortunate to have the leaders uh, that we have in Vermont. The governor certainly with his uh, opioid uh, commission, um, Jolinda Leclaire mm -hmm. heading up uh, you know what appears to be a, you know, a, an overarching very dedicated uh, push to do something about this issue. What is it that's risen to the surface in your awareness? Uh, in, your, in your daily practice of your job uh, regarding the opioid crisis? What is it that's gotten your attention? Well, I mean, personally, as a prosecutor, I've known since the start that we can't incarcerate our way out of this problem. Um, 
that's been very clear to me, and, and it's frankly one of the reasons I became a prosecutor because I, you know, I, I wanted to be a defense attorney for the longest time, and then right. kind of realized that as a prosecutor, you can um, do a lot more good in the in the actual system if you're the one with that you know power, for lack of a better word. Mm -hmm. um, but personally, my experience has been kind of sculpted by the fact that we as state's attorneys and as deputies respond to uh, every untimely death in the in the county uh, which a lot of people don't realize and so when I first you know fresh out of law school thought um, I'd be in court every day I had no idea I'd be going to to the scenes of um, people who have just died and I thought that that would probably be elderly individuals who are dying in their sleep but um, what it ended up being was a overwhelming amount of suicides that I didn't expect and an overwhelming amount of overdose fatalities. And, you know, as a young prosecutor fresh out of law school at right. three in the morning going to the home and telling a family that, you know, you're sorry for their loss, um, it just really struck me as like, what, what is happening? Why, why is this happening all the time? Um, when we're responding to scenes like that every week sure. um, for young people, older people, sure. people with full-time jobs, people with good families and good relationships, and people with no homes and no families and no relationships. Um, it just, it occurred to me that this was a serious issue that is not, it wasn't from my perspective being talked about. I, I hear you, and uh, that resonates deeply with me, <clears throat> that uh, this is a, a disease. We call it a, an addiction, but it is very much a brain disease. Uh, it's not a choice. People don't develop it on purpose. It develops innocently, and it can develop in anyone. Now, I think the statistics for 2016 were 106 deaths specifically attributable to opioid overdose, but I uh, we do believe that it's more than that. Is that your impression? Absolutely. I'm sure that it's more than that. And mm -hmm. we don't have the officials, official numbers yet for um, 17, but my understanding is that it'll be around 135. Um, but even that, I don't believe, is, is the full amount. I think that we're missing a lot of people that um, not only I, do I just believe that they maybe died from endocarditis, for example, okay. but they're really dying due to their their substance use disorder and even more so people that maybe are dying in in communities like the upper valley where i'm from mm -hmm. who are dying in new hampshire mm -hmm. because they're dying at dartmouth hitchcock All right. or they're dying um in little littleton when from St. Johnsbury. All, right. All of those numbers aren't being counted in our Vermont numbers because they're not dying here, but there are there are people <laughs> there are they're vermonters and um, so I think the numbers are higher than, than we are seeing. It's very, very hard to track with accuracy uh, the number of fatalities. And when you add into that naloxone, yep. the statistics for 2016 were 423 layperson administrations of naloxone. 416 of them were successful. Seven people died. But so you have 413 people overdosing on opioids who, where the overdose is reversed, yeah. without naloxone, the fatalities would be mar markedly higher. Yeah. So it's interesting. You know, we have naloxone, we have hub and spoke, we have safe uh, needle exchanges. We have a lot of activities in Vermont that are very progressive to deal with the opioid crisis. But at the same time, as you're noting, the fatality rate is increasing. So what's next? What, what, what do we do next? Well, I think we have a lot to do. Um, I think that we need more treatment options. We need more uh, inpatient uh, rehabilitation beds. Mm -hmm. um, we need more doctors prescribing. Mm -hmm. um, we need naloxone, Narcan in more hands. It, you know, we need that to be available to more people. And, you know, I, one of the things that I've talked about a lot lately is the potential for a safe consumption site or a safe injection site, supervised consumption, whatever you want to call it. Okay. 
That's a courageous uh, dialogue to open in Vermont. It is. I think most of the people that I know <clears throat> over the course of uh, the last two decades, uh, a methadone treatment in Vermont was a stretch that was very, very difficult for people to accept. Buprenorphine treatment, or sub commonly known as Suboxone, was a stretch. People really had to open their minds to that and see that it was a medication. It simply wasn't a replacement. Uh, safe needle exchanges, another issue. <clears throat> and now we have safe injection facilities, or there's lots of names for it, but, yeah. but safe injection sites. Yeah. What is it? What is it? Um, I know you've researched this fully. Um, I just would like to give you the opportunity to open this dialogue a little further, to talk a little bit about it. What is it about safe injection facilities um, that you find works in terms of saving lives? Well, the one thing I would say to start is that there's about, uh, you know, this is a new idea in Vermont um, and somewhat of a new idea in the U.S., but it's a very old idea. Um, they've been, they have been, implemented in other countries. There's over a hundred of them worldwide um, for over 30 years. Okay. So the idea is actually very simple. It's just a space where people who are actively injecting um, heroin or other, really any unsafe practice in, in drug use can go and use their drugs with clean and sterile product in a clean space, have the ability even to clean, you know, such a small thing as cleaning their arm um, before or wherever they're injecting before injecting, that some of these individuals just don't even have access to that most basic need. And they're supervised while they do it so that if they do overdose, somebody is there to help them uh, medically. They then have a kind of safe space after to, you know, chill out is a, mm -hmm. what a lot of them are called, the chill out zone. Mm -hmm. And even mm -hmm. more important, if one of those many times they go to use the facility, they find themselves at a place where they're ready um, for further help, for treatment, or whatever that might mean for them to get into recovery, that is also there. That service is there, that resource is there. Mm -hmm. And you know, for me, the important part of it is that we're not getting to everybody right now. And they might not be at a place where they're ready for that service or resource, but that doesn't mean we shouldn't care about them or we shouldn't be making sure they're alive in the meantime until they are. And, you know, the, the kind of quote of, you know, you, dead people can't recover. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. that's what I feel like safe consumption sites do. There's, like I said, over 100 worldwide, and there has never been a single death. Never been a single death? Not one single fatality in any of the sites mm -hmm. worldwide. Well, that's pretty impressive. <clears throat> yes. I, I took the liberty of um, reviewing your commission's uh, report, and they uh, take a look at uh, two uh, needle exchange programs in Vermont. Yep. One being right here in uh, Chittenden County, the um, Safe Recovery. Correct. <clears throat> now, they conducted, the commission conducted a, a, a fairly uh, extensive um, survey, and they found that 90% of the people that use Safe Recovery, a needle exchange, yep. said they would be willing to use a safe injection facility. Now, we know now that the majority of people who overdose with a fatality resulting are injecting opioids alone. Correct. So it seems, that the, it seems then that a safe injection facility, as you're saying, would prevent every one of those overdoses where someone overdoses because they're alone and there's no one available to administer naloxone. Do you agree with that? I do. If, if every one of those individuals was using a, a facility, every one of those lives would, in theory, be saved. The research, I think, also shows that, uh, just to be uh, specific about it, 34% mm -hmm. 
of the respondents, there were 85 respondents to the survey, Correct. reported uh, contracting hepatitis C. 3% mm -hmm. of the survey reported contracting HIV. Right. If those individuals had been using a safe injection facility, 0% would have uh, contracted hepatitis C and 0% would have contracted HIV if they had right. been following the instructions at the safe injection facility. Right. Yeah. So what, what happens then is I think there's a, this kind of a, it's a hard uh, distinction to make between the value of harm reduction and the value of use reduction. Most people Absolutely. value use reduction. Right. The number of people injecting um, heroin or opioids would, would, would decrease. <clears throat> Harm reduction is something different. Yeah. The number of people inject, injecting opioids can remain exactly the same, right. but the harm associated with the injection is decreased. Would you like to um, talk about that for a minute? <clears throat> yeah, I mean, I, I absolutely agree. I think that those two things too often get seen as the same. And I think a lot of the reason that people initially might have a visceral reaction to the idea of safe consumption sites, and to be honest, I did too before I did any research, sure. is that you do have this idea that if you really want to help, you'll get more people into treatment, which I, of course, agree with that. Um, mm -hmm. I think we would all love for that to happen, and for every person we had come into contact with who has substance use disorder, we'd get into treatment. But it's not realistic, you know. The and I see that all the time with individuals that are unfortunately also committing crimes. But um, not everybody is at that place, and so you need to focus on how you can keep those people alive. Yeah while they are in that throw of addiction. Um, sorry, try not to use that word. That's something that's getting used to. But um, substance use disorder, until they're ready, until they're at this place where they can. And in the meantime, I mean, harm reduction literally is reducing the harm to each person while they are actively injecting. Absolutely. And I, and I think you bring up uh, quite a few very important points. This idea of brain addiction or substance use disorder, <clears throat> I think that the general public sometimes really doesn't understand exactly what it means. Yeah. So you have uh, people that are injecting a drug. I have never met anyone, and I was a therapist for 30 years dealing with this population. I've never met anyone who began using drugs uh, by injecting them. Right. <clears throat> the disease itself pushes the person toward injection if they're using opioids, yep. because injection is the most efficient way to deliver the drug molecule to the receptors in the brain right. by way of the blood. It's just simply efficient. And people are driven to the desperation of injecting drugs by the disease itself. They overcome um, their sensibility toward what's safe and what's not safe because of the desperation of needing to self-administer the drugs. It's a symptom of the disease. It's a symptom of the diseased mind. It's not a choice. Right. Have you ever met anyone that wasn't afraid of needles? <clears throat> <laughs> not many. I've never met anybody. I mean, yeah. people go for flu shots and they can't watch. Right. Who wants to inject a drug? Right. No one, but it's the desperation of the disease that pushes people toward that. I, 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 I really um, appreciate your compassion for this uh, particular uh, population. What do you, when you, when you look at the, um, I mean, Vermonters are wonderful. No Vermonter wants to abandon another Vermonter. But again, this is a, a stretch. This is a very, very hard thing for the general public to, to get their mind around. What do, you, what do you see as, um, you know, facing your advocacy for this in the future? What, what do you see as obstacles moving forward, or more better than obstacles, areas where the general public would need to be uh, educated? <clears throat> I think that the 
first, the education needs to come in what these facilities are actually for and the, the real truth behind harm reduction. And the idea that even if harm reduction is our goal, there is a lot of research that these facilities get more people into recovery. Right. Um, yeah. So that is still happening. Mm -hmm. um, but in the meantime, getting over this idea that we're enabling yeah. drugs or drug use, um, and when in fact we're enabling safe use and we're enabling people to stay alive. But beyond that, I think that the real education needs to come in uh, the reality of resources being spent because, you know, I've, I've had a lot of people say, I don't think our tax money should be going towards this or we have limited resources and so we should be spending it on prevention or education or treatment or you know like like we have to do one or the other mm. when from my perspective i don't think most people in vermont realize how much money we're already spending on this sure. crisis in ways that they don't think about and not just in incarceration costs which i see or supervision costs because of the crimes some individuals are committing but in medicaid costs for endocarditis and infection, blood infections and site infections, HIV, hepatitis, all of these things that we're already spending a lot of money mm -hmm. on. So it really, I, I understand that we're lim we have limited resources. I'm a state employee. I know that. <laughs> I'm, I'm well aware of how limited our resources are, but <clears throat> we need to really be transparent um, about our resources that we're already spending because I think that most people would be pretty appalled at how much we're having to spend on the other end of this crisis and, and from my perspective mostly in medical costs that we could if we're putting more money into preventing you know unsafe use and dirty needles or discarded needles in the park or in public restrooms mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. putting more yeah. into facilities like this and safe recovery in general, not mm -hmm. just if they had a safe consumption site, but just safe recovery in what they do now, um, putting more res resources into places like that, um, we'd actually end up saving money. I, I agree with you. And I think um, this is a long battle going forward that will, um, the duration will be decades, generations. One of the, one of the um, areas that I think we're beginning to look at is adverse childhood experiences, or ACEs, that the um, children who are exposed to five or six adverse childhood experiences in their lifetime are 40 or 50 times more likely to become uh, addicted to opioids. <clears throat> so. It, when you look at the resources that we are going to need as a culture, as a state, as a society, to spend really absolutely doing, doing something about this that's going to make this a pivotal moment in our history, it, it's staggering, yeah. really, to look at. There's prevention. There's education. There's treatment. There's harm reduction. There's recovery support services. But... Now more than, than ever before, and I think in American history, the attention is being paid to, to this. And we, I think we've got traction. You have the um, President's Commission on Opioids and uh, Drug Addiction in America. Uh, if, you, if you read those recommendations, I think there's, uh, there's uh, over 50 recommendations. Uh, if those recommendations were followed, we would really be doing something about this epidemic. When you read uh, Governor Scott's recommendations, if those recommendations were followed, mm -hmm. we would really be doing something about uh, this epidemic in America. Where do, you, where do you see us going with that? Where do you see us as far as the funds being allocated going forward to adequately deal with these problems? <clears throat> you know, that's a good question. And this mm -hmm. is, I think I've said this to you before, like I'm very new to politics and, mm -hmm. and really funding in general is never, as a, pro, as a deputy, I always was just worried about how much can I get paid more? Because I was, you know, I feel like the deputies <laughs> in this state, um, every deputy state's attorney, public defenders do not get paid enough money um, for all the work they do. But beyond that, I didn't really have a lot of concept 
either um, with how much we're spending. I really don't know. I think that I think that the numbers really need to be shown. Um, I know that the medical center is working now on prescriber numbers. UVM. Yep. U yeah. yeah, UVM Medical Center, as well as they are starting to give us um, information on endocarditis costs. And so I think bef now that those numbers are really starting to show themselves, I do think that the resources can be spent the way that they should be in terms of a safe consumption site. Um, you know, I don't know where we're at with that. I, I think that if it was p to be done in a place like Safe Recovery where so much of these right. services are already being, right. um, the cost really wouldn't be that high. And so if we can really start to figure out, figure out with or without the legislation, just figure out how much would something like this cost um, and can we project how much we might save by having it, um, I think there's a. I think there really is a likelihood for it in Chittenden County. All right, thank you. Thank you for your courage and thank you for your your efforts. Um, Bertha Madras is uh, was the lead author of the President's Commission on Opioids and Drug Addiction, and I had um, the pleasure of attending a webinar <clears throat> with her recently. And um, the way she closed uh, the webinar was. With, with an appeal to the general public, <clears throat> noting that, that, that this effort will, has, the only way it can really succeed is if the general public educates itself and becomes as involved as possible yeah. from everybody according to their ability. People who want to volunteer, certainly AANA, the volunteer programs out there, and the regular citizens to just get, get more involved in this and learn whatever they can do to support these kinds of initiatives. I'd like to, to give you the opportunity to close the show and um, really to, to make a statement to the general public. <clears throat> do, do you I mean, what are you, what's your feeling about the general public's role in, in this? <clears throat> yeah, well, I, I wish I could have heard what she said because that's, that is something that I try to tell people all the time. Ever since I announced my support for this legislation, you know, I've I've gotten a lot of really great feedback from people, um, people that know nothing about safe consumption sites, but are just excited to have this really open dialogue um, and have more conversations like this, where maybe the opening of a facility isn't the end result, but in the meantime, mm -hmm. this really great dialogue is happening. Yeah. Mm -hmm. about substance use disorder and the opioid crisis and the reality of it, not just people talking about there being a crisis, but really delving into it. Sure. Mm -hmm. But I would echo that. I've also had a lot of people that have emailed me or called me saying pretty horrible things um, oh, okay. <clears throat> that have clearly yeah. not done any research. Right. They have made this opinion about it, um, about safe consumption facilities mm -hmm. specifically, without doing any research. And, you know, I've, I've developed a thick skin in this job, and that doesn't, it doesn't bother me, but I just, I just would hope or I'd ask that people do five minutes of research yeah. about the topic that they want to have an opinion about before, um, before engaging in a conversation, I'm I disagree with people all the time. I'm I'm a lawyer, you know. That's that's what I do. But I do my very best to make sure that I know what I'm talking about and have a basis for my opinion before I do it. Um, you know, I'm in court every day asking a jury to believe my version of an event, and sure. that's based on what I think the evidence is or what I think the facts are, and so. I would just ask the same of anybody else who wants to engage in a conversation about something like this. And if you don't do that, you know, step back from it mm -hmm. and just listen to the conversations that are happening before you decide to engage. Well, hopefully your appearance on this show today will, will help the general public yeah. to educate themselves and maybe spark some interest so people can go out there individually, do their own research, and of course, reach their own conclusion Absolutely. about something as important as this. Yeah. And just an additional, just a, an additional question to you. 
one more opportunity for you <laughs> is to really, um, what would you say to the, the person out there with opioid use disorder or heroin use disorder who's injecting um, uh, potentially uh, lethal drugs? What would you say to them, Sarah? Um, if you are in Chittenden County, I would encourage them to go to safe recovery um, or any place where they feel safe to talk to somebody, um, talk to a, if they have insurance and can talk to a, a provider about safe practices. Um, if they're not ready for services or, or resources or recovery. Um, and just know that, you know, I'm the, the top prosecutor in Chittenden County and I am, I would talk to anybody about it. I want people to feel, I don't want to just say that I, you know, that I want to support these individuals. I truly want to support these individuals. And so, you know, I'm in a public office and if somebody feels like they are ready for that and they don't know how to do it, I encourage them to go anywhere they feel safe. Um, and if that means coming to my office, then they can come to my office. And if that means going to um, the Burlington Police Department, which I know might sound mm. weird, but mm. they do have an incredible worker there, um, that this is her passion and this is her job. Jackie. Is to, yes, Jackie Corbley will will absolutely help get them into services. Um, I have a coordinator in my office, Emmett Helrick, who is absolutely incredible at getting people um, the help that they need. Um, but, but anybody, and don't, and don't use alone. Yeah. Um, yeah. You know, if you are injecting with the, I mean, they're yeah. already, um, this likelihood is already there, but with the fentanyl and carfentanyl that is, in uh, the heroin now, it, it's just terrifying how many people are dying. So don't use alone. Um, use with somebody, have Narcan available. If you have family members, make sure they have Narcan. Um, friends that are around you, don't use in your cars, in traffic. Yeah. Um, use in safe places um, with people around you. Very well said, Sarah, and, and thank you so much for joining me today. Yeah, absolutely. Thanks for having me, Ed.